Um, let me start by offering you my conclusion. It will make it easier to follow how did the party come to control the people by using a method and by using a strategy. The method is the stick and the carrot. The stick is systematic violence and calculated terror designed to instill fear and intimidation into anybody who comes into contact with the Communist Party of China. But the history of communism isn't just about violence. There's also the carrot. The history of communism in China and elsewhere is also a history of promises made and promises broken. Mao and the communists, like his predecessor, the Bolsheviks and Lenin, promised every disaffected group what they wanted most, land for the farmers, better working conditions for workers, protection of private property for the entrepreneurs, and of course, freedom of expression for intellectuals. One by one, these promises were broken, as we shall see in a moment. There is a stick, there is a carrot, but there is also a strategy. And the strategy was announced quite clearly by Mao in August 1950, less than a year after so-called liberation. Mao said, rally the majority, isolate the minority, rally a majority, isolate a minority, and take out the enemies one by one. And this is precisely what happened in the 1950s. Now, normally I should start with 1949, but since that year marked not so much a peaceful liberation as the propaganda has it, but rather the culmination of a violent military conquest, it is necessary for us to go back a little bit. The key act that leads to the People's Republic of China is decided in Moscow by Stalin. On 8 August 1945, Stalin and the Red Army invade Manchuria, the region to the north of Beijing. They also take over the north of Korea. Stalin had also invaded half of Europe and wasn't about to leave. Equally, he stayed in Manchuria. He handed over the countryside to Mao and his guerrilla fighters. They didn't leave, even after Japan's capitulation. Stalin reinforced Mao's army and turned a ragtag collection of guerrilla fighters into a formidable fighting machine. Logistical aid arrived across the border by rail and by air. From North Korea alone, some 2,000 wagon loads allocated to the task of arming Mao. Officers were sent to Moscow for advanced training. Truman, in the meantime, in September 1946, imposed an arms embargo. Chiang Kai-shek, head of the nationalists, was still determined to conquer Manchuria and take it back from Mao Zedong and the communists. He poured his very best troops into Manchuria. Much of his troops were destroyed in a pitiless war of attrition. In 1948, the communists approached their first big city, a city called Changchun, right bang in the middle of Manchuria. Seeing that the city would not surrender, Lin Biao, a small man in charge of the army at that point in time, decided to starve this city into surrender. He gave the order, turn Changchun into a city of death. He imposed a barricade with a sentry every 50 meters, trenches two to three meters deep. Nobody was allowed to leave Changchun. The civilian population was literally starved to death. At least 160,000 ordinary people died in the siege of Changchun. It showed 
the steely determination of the communists to submit local combinations, lo local populations to their will. Other cities followed Beijing, unwilling to undergo the fate of Changchun, surrendered one after the other like dominoes, cities fell. By the end of 1949, Chiang Kai-shek and the nationalists went to Taiwan, never to return. Once the red flag went up, the communists had no alternative but to ask the old government employees and police to stay on. They couldn't run the country otherwise. It's a large country. They promised them protection and even the gratitude of the party. The police collaborated. They did the rounds. The very first thing they did was to impose a class label on every person in the cities. There were so-called good classes, revolutionary soldiers, workers, and there were bad classes, so-called landlords and capitalists. Intellectuals were in between, referred to as middle classes, but soon enough, these class designations were simplified into red and black, friend and foe. All of them, regardless of their class label, which determined not only their own fates, but also the fates of their children, since the class label was inherited, all of them had to go back to school. From Beijing in the north all the way to Guangzhou in the south, cities became adult re-education centers. People were asked to learn the new orthodoxy and turn themselves into new people. This is the start of thought reform. It starts right away, 1949. But there were already victims at this early stage, prostitutes, paupers, pickpockets, but also millions of refugees and disbanded soldiers sent to the countryside which became the great dumping ground of all undesirable elements. Foreigners left in droves. How about the countryside? In return for a plot of land, farmers had to physically eliminate their elected leaders. Work teams in all villages from north to south were given targets of people to be denounced, humiliated, dispossessed, and murdered with villagers assembled in the hundreds in an atmosphere of hatred. In other words, Mao made sure that with land distribution, every person in the countryside had blood on their hands. All of them were implicated in the murder of a small number of carefully selected targets. In other words, the pact between the poor and the party was sealed in blood. Or to put it even differently, a sufficient quantity of blood had to be shed in order to make a return to the old order impossible. Nobody in these villages was allowed to stand on the side to not participate in these denunciations of so-called landlords was to risk being denounced oneself. People were forced to go along. With land reform, any return to the past becomes impossible. All are implicated in murder. Land reform is pretty much over by the end of 1950, but peace, so much promised by the Communist Party of China, uh, is delayed. In October 1950, Mao Zedong sends troops into Korea. China joins the war. Mao uses the war to rally popular support at home, but also lash out at his victims, so-called remnants of the communists, uh, remnants of the remnant troops of, the, of Chiang Kai-shek, spies, secret agents, bandits, anybody who stands on the path. 
to revolution must be eliminated. It is a campaign of terror that unfolds from October 1950 to October 1951. How many counter-revolutionaries are there? Well, very much like steel output and grain production, death comes with a quota. Mao decides that killing one per thousand in the population should be enough. But before you know it, of course, villages vie with villages, local cadres with other cadres, provinces with provinces, in order to eliminate as many enemies as they possibly can. In some places, children aged six are accused of being spy leaders and tortured to death. In a province like Guangdong, the size of France, one third of all those accused of a counter-revolutionary act are innocent by the standards of the party itself at the time. About 1.2 million people were killed during land reform. Now a further 2 million people are executed, often in public stadiums, in cities, and the countryside alike. By the time this campaign of terror reaches its end in October 1951, Mao turns his gaze towards corruption inside the ranks of the party itself, very reminiscent of a campaign we've had recently under Xi Jinping, who studies the period rather carefully, and so should we. The high point of this campaign comes on a cold, wintry night in February 1952, when two high-ranking officers are shot in the heart rather than in the head as a concession to their status. This trial sends ripples through the ranks of the party. At least 10,000 cases of corruption are found in the upper echelons of the party. But something much more sinister is happening here. Under cover of popular support for a campaign against corruption inside the party, the very civil servants and police who were recruited by the party in 1949 are quietly being eliminated. A million of them are dismissed since a sufficient number of new cadres has been trained and they are no longer needed. Many of them are sent straight to the gulag. Corruption, of course, doesn't just appear out of nowhere. Mao, in 1952, decides that people in the party have been corrupted by the so-called sugar bullets of the bourgeoisie in 1952, starts a ruthless campaign against the private sector. The very techniques learned during land reform are now being replicated inside the cities as workers assemble to denounce their leaders, whether they are small, ordinary shopkeepers or powerful industrialists. Some of them turn against each other, knowing dirty secrets on each other's families. In Shanghai alone, within two months, over 600 people commit suicide. This is very much the end of the private sector. Well, from here onwards, one after the other, each particular social group is being crushed. The next one are the farmers. In 1953, Stalin dies. Mao uses the opportunity to crank up the pace of collectivization. By the end of 1953, a monopoly on the grain is imposed. In other words, farmers who produce food must sell the grain to the state at state-mandated prices in state-determined quantities in state-run shops. They lose control over their crop. A famine appears the following year, 1954. The response of the state is to curtail all freedom of movement in 1955 with the introduction of an internal passport system called Huko, or registration system, copied very much from the Soviet Union. At this point, major farms are being introduced 
copied from the Soviet Union. Farmers are herded into these state farms and lose their land. They lose control over their livelihoods. They become bonded servants at the back and call of local carders. In 1956, there is a major explosion of discontent, much of it fueled by Khrushchev's speech against Stalin. Khrushchev accuses his erstwhile leader of having fostered a cult of personality and having presided over a reign of terror. Mao, of course, sees himself as the Stalin of China and sees it as a personal attack on himself. In order to regain moral leadership over the party itself and the country, he poses as a champion of the ordinary man. He strikes a tone which is even more liberal than his counterpart in Moscow. He admonishes the party to accept freedom of expression. Mao becomes a defender of democratic values. He asked that a hundred flowers bloom, a hundred schools contend. People take him at his word. They contend. Strikers go on strike. Intellectuals demonstrate in the streets. Farmers leave the collectives in droves. It, go, it goes too far as intellectuals start asking that the Communist Party step down. In 1957, Mao turns against all those who have spoken out and puts Deng Xiaoping in charge of a campaign that ships pretty much half a million students and intellectuals to the Gulag. In 1958 starts a great leap forward as Mao wishes to, to transform China into a major industrial power. He does this by herding people in massive people's communes run according to military lines. Every incentive to work is stripped from people. For the cultivator, there is no reason left to work. The land belongs to the state. The crop he produces is procured by the state at a price a low cost of production. Tools, utensils, even the homes of ordinary people now belong to these people's communes. The carders, on the other hand, have to whip up the workforce in one drive after the other. Violence becomes the foundation of this period as carders have to whip up the workforce and force them back into the fields. Of course, we know the result a huge famine as at least 45 million people are worked, starved, or literally beaten to death. By 1962, I have a few minutes left, by 1962, the question is no longer how the party controls the people. The question becomes, how does Mao control the party? And what consequences does it have for the people? Mao realizes that he has caused a huge famine and is afraid that he will be replaced, his legacy attacked by some Chinese Khrushchev, the same way that Khrushchev denounced Stalin. His answer is to start a cultural revolution in 1966 in the name of sweeping away all bourgeois and capitalist thinking, he uses Red Guards to attack the party itself. Soon enough, it becomes chaos as Red Guards fight Red Guards, workers fight workers, all in the name of Mao Zedong thought and revolutionary purity. But Mao relishes the chaos. He may not be in control, but he's always in charge. He's a lord of misrule. He's the one who relishes a game in which he can set the rules, bending and breaking millions along the way. In 1968, the army comes in and turns China into a gigantic garrison state in which up to 50, 
one in 50 people are persecuted for the most minor infraction, whether selling a potato on the black market or poking a hole in a poster of Chairman Mao. But by 1971, the army itself becomes subject of a purge as Mao fears that Lin Biao might launch a coup against him. Lin Biao dies in a mysterious crash, plane crash. The army is purged, and by then, ordinary people realize that the party has suffered hugely from the Cultural Revolution. Very quietly, millions upon millions of ordinary people in the countryside start reconnecting with the past. From 1971 to the death of Mao in 1976, there is a silent revolution in which ordinary people reconnect with the past, open black markets, divide the land, distribute collective assets, operate underground factories. In other words, they go capitalist. Already before Mao dies at 76, ordinary people have gone back to capitalism. Deng Xiaoping has no way to fight this extraordinary reconnection with the past that comes from below. The true architects of economic reform are the people. But Deng Xiaoping is clever enough to use economic growth to rebuild the party and consolidate its power. In 1989, he sends troops into Tiananmen Square. The massacre is a display of brutal power and steely resolve designed to send a signal that pulsates to this day. The signal is, do not query the monopoly of the one-party state. Thank you. Thank you very much uh, for that. Thank you very much for that uh, really brilliant uh, analysis of the Communist Party. And I think one of the most interesting things that I just interrupt for a second, that when you said it was the people who began reconnecting with the past and who were looking forward to a more capitalist and entrepreneurial approach. This was in the, in the, in the 1970s and 1980s and how Ding, Deng Xiaoping took advantage of that. that that's an extraordinary uh, insight, I think, that we need to, to think about. And now it's, it's my pleasure to invite our final panelist to either stand or sit as he prefers <laughs> and to give us uh, his thoughts about this very important subject. First, uh, thanks very much for VOC to hold this conference. The question I want to talk about here or discuss with you is a very simple question. The question is, is uh, Xi Jinping will lead China to a, another version of a Mao's regime. Hey, well, it, it looks like that Xi Jinping himself has these ambitions, but can he really achieve this goal? That's my question. I think it depends on many, many key factors, but I want to focus one factor, that is, will younger generation of China will follow Xi Jinping. So that's very important. How about younger generation of China now? I'm, I'm now teaching in two universities of Taiwan at the same time. That make, make me lost my English, forgive me, but give me a chance to get to know a lot of young people from mainland China. Because more and more of them come to Taiwan to study. From my experience of observing them, I actually put a lot of hope on them. Why? Here I give you an example. In 2017, there's a Taiwanese singer, I don't know anybody know her name, Zhang Xuan, very famous, popular singer. 
displayed the Republic of China flag on the stage and was shouted by a student from China, mainland China. The incident has kindled a blaze of reactions from the internet, you, you can guess. Internet users in Hong Kong and Taiwan with many accusing young people in China of being brainwashed. However, a comment about the incident from a student in China tells a different story. He wrote a letter to me. Those people who think that young people in China are one big crowd of brainwashed, angry youth may like to read this message, this letter. They may discover that they got the wrong idea, I think. The student's message I just called as following. He read letters to me. He said, freedom is precious and very fragile. I do not think the quest for freedom will ever end. If you agree with me and what I just said, please click on like and share it to let the whole world know that young people in China are definitely not all the kind who would yield no politics today at the single term. They are not all the kind of people who have been made into mental slaves by, politi by political operation and who do not care about politics or dare to talk about it, even when they are abroad. He continued in his letter. There are other people in this country who want to stand up and do something, even if they know it is dangerous, and who keep up their moral and even physical courage and set out to achieve their ideas. This is his letter. I don't know how do you feel about this letter, but in my, uh, in my opinion, in China's online world, political control create an environment in which it is hard for the voices of people who do not trust government to get much attention. However, those who are familiar with the way the internet works in China would see that if the internet were not so tightly monitored and controlled, and if people were not so worried about speaking their mind, it's hard to see which side would have the loudest voice. The foreign nationalists or the likes of the student who wrote the message, wrote this letter. Where some people get carried away with nationalistic fever, most members of Chinese society say nothing. They keep silence. But their silence do not mean they have no opinion. This day is clear that some people in the government and the society at large have realized that overheated nationalistic sentiment might turn into their upside and could even cause trouble for the authorities. As a result, Two contradictory trends can be seen in what the Chinese government says and does. On one hand, Chinese media keep using the same old method to whip up nationalistic feelings. But on the other hand, the authorities can be seen doing everything they can do to cool down popular nationalism when it looks as though it might get out of control, as everybody knows. This contradiction shows the predicament in which the Chinese government offer, often found itself. It comes under pressure from its supporters as well as those who have less faith in it. And a regime that exists without an electoral basis will eventually find that even its supporters cannot necessarily be relied to be believed. In an ever more diverse society, a government that thinks it can establish and can consolidate its legitimacy 
by using nationalism is only making trouble for itself. And I do think this needs to be carefully considered when reading what internet users have to say about Xinjiang, Tibet, and other such issues. This is my story about the younger generation. But from the start from this, my next question is, what's the future of CCP? This is a big, big question, I know, but I just want to tell you a story. It's a very, very funny story. A story from a famous book. I bet most of you have already read this book. It's a Peter Hitler's book. Country Driving, A Journey from Farm to Factory. Right? Many people know this book. This book reveals many astonishing things about grassroots Chinese society based on the author's experience of driving around a large part of China. Here's one story in his book. It's very interesting. One day, Hitler is stopped. When, when he's driving around, he, he's stopped and questioned by a group of highway traffic police. It's, it's terrific. The author described the things as follows. So I quote his story. He, uh, Hitler said in his book, you must be a spy. The one police said, you must be a spy. The others picked up the refrain, laughing. He's a spy. He's driving around, and he speaks, he means uh, Peter Hitler. He speaks Chinese. He must be a spy, a spy, a spy. Shaking his laughter, the cop returned both my license, Hitler, Hitler's license. It took me a while to find my voice. It's okay if I continue? He asked, please. Of course. Of course you can go. So driving away, looking through the mirror, Hitler could see them on the side of the road. The cops, those cops, young cops, punched each other and they laughed, a spy, a spy. Here's the story. What you can see from this story? I can see the future of China from this story. Why? This little incident, which leaves the readers not sure whether to laugh or cry, this is China, reflect a number of profound truths. The key point is that, whereas Hitler was so worried when he heard the police see he's a spy that he lost his words for a while, the outcome was that the police officers did not follow up on the assessment of the situation by taking any action whatsoever, but simply let him go, leaving him on his way. First, first seeing he was a spy, but then letting him go were laughing heartily. It's even more absurd that the absurdity previously mentioned and this signaled a totalitarian regime. What's the characteristic of a totalitarian regime? The first reason for saying this is that when the logic of a totalitarian system reaches a certain degree of absurdity, the result will be that even the people responsible for operating the system come to see the whole thing just as a joke. They do not believe it. To put it another way, under such a system, when the theories that those in charge used to poison other people's mind are seen, are seen alongside reality, the so sooner or later it will reach a situation where the system's enforcers no longer believe in themselves. It's very dangerous for regime. Consider some of terms like to be used in China today, socialism. The Communist Party is there to serve the people, prospering together and so on and blah, blah, blah. How many people still believe in such noble sounding slogans? How many? History tells us that when any system reaches the point where even those who run the system no longer believe in its underlying theories, it will be hard to keep it going for much longer. 
That's from the license of history. The second reason is, on the face of it, the Chinese Communist Party has a vast and tightly controlled system, of course, for maintaining stability. Social controls seem to reach everywhere. Frequent driver's license checks by highway police are just one link in the chain. You would, you would think that such a system could not fall apart. But you then have to ask why all totalitarian regimes in the history have all fallen one after another. That's also the truth of history. The reason is quite simple. No matter how strict a system may be, it still needs individuals, need a person, personnel, or just person to keep it going. When those individuals no longer strictly enforce the system, then the system is going to be break down. If the traffic police in Hitler's book really thought they were up against an enemy agent, a spy, they should have interrogated him, like in the Cultural Revolution period. But as it turned out, they thought nothing about it. Then this is how the system is cracking, I think. The Communist Party system for maintaining stability is indeed vast, yet it's not capable of controlling every one of these whose job is to keep it going. It may take just one incident involving one individual for the rampant of the system to crumple and collapse. Among the huge force of people charged with maintaining stability in China, my question is, who can guarantee that none of them will cause such incident? This is the question I would like leave to you to think about. Thank you very much.